Hi, my name is Katie and I'm the Executive Director and Curator at the Clark Historical Museum in Old Town. And today I'll be sharing about our some of our crazy quilts at the Clark Museum. Uh, we have a pretty good sized collection of them, but this presentation is only going to highlight about three of them and give you a little bit of information on the historical background and components of crazy quilts. Crazy quilts were historically produced at a really interesting time in U.S. history. It was the late, late 1800s or through to the about the 1920s, mid-1920s, that crazy quilts were most popular. Um, and at this time, there was a lot of intense change going on in the United States. So one of the things that kicked off the crazy quilt trend was an international exposition. It was the 1876 United States Centennial International Exposition to celebrate the centennial of the United States. And at this exhibition, the um, there were people from around the world that came to have displays. And this was the first time that Japanese art was displayed in the United States in a organized fashion. So this was the first time that many Americans got to experience uh, Japanese and Chinese art. Um, for themselves. And a lot of people attended this exhibition, um, especially in comparison to what the population was at the time. There was also a very famous opera comedy called The Mikado that came out uh, a little bit after the exposition. And uh, it was about um, a guy and he was featured to be wearing a really unique kimono that looks a lot like the one here on the far right. Um, this is called a Yosagiri kimono, and it's made up of patches of silks from various different pieces. Uh, silk was very, very valuable, of course. It was passed down from generation to generation. So you wanted to be able to reuse as much of it as you can. And this is, this picture here on the far right is um, the oldest Yosagiri kimono um, in existence. It's from the 1500s. Um, so this kind of compilation of international um, interest in Japanese, Chinese, and Asian art forms um, being presented to the United States kind of general population on such a large scale through this 1876 exposition um, created a lot of interest in Asian art, including silks and this kind of pieced look. Other contributing elements, of course, are the expansion of industrialization. It was easier for things and people and ideas to travel um, as transportation technology improved. Um, that also meant that people could get a hold of many different types of fabrics. Um, this was also a time period, of course, in the Victorian era where women were in charge of the home and beautifying the home as part of this aesthetic movement, which was very popular at the time. And that included creating pieces of art like these like these crazy quilts that feature bright colors, really intricate embroidery work. Um, and being a skilled embroiderer was a, kind of a sign of status that you had t time on your hands to be able to do these very um, unique and dedicated stitches. Many of the stitches were also found in various women's magazines as well. Um, so you could show that you were a well-read lady and had time on your hands to create these pieces of art. So let's talk a little bit about construction. For this particular quilt here, um, this is an unfinished crazy quilt that does not have a back on it. This is what the back side of it looks like. Um, pieces of muslin here cut into squares and then sewn together, you can see. Um, this particular quilt was probably an Oddfellows quilt. It started as a fundraiser. It was never finished for one reason or another, um, but it includes all kinds of different, really elaborate work, including hand-painted flowers, initials, various types of embroidery and we can kind of get a general idea of when this quilt was made because it has February 1894 embroidered on it. So this isn't the prettiest side of the quilt but it gives you kind of an idea of how these quilts were constructed. Here's a closer up look. So on the front of the quilt the quilt would be pieced and then the embroidery would be done going through the colorful pieces of silk and various types of fabric onto that backing fabric, this muslin here. And that would strengthen the stitches and provide some support for those 
um, more delicate fabrics on the front there. So this is kind of cool to see all the different colors of um, embroidery thread on the back here because sometimes on the front there's already so much going on that you can't see the colors for themselves. This is what the front of that quilt looks like. Um, you can see it's made up of blocks, like I mentioned earlier, and these individual blocks have been sewn together. So what probably happened with this quilt was that a woman or a couple of women were in charge of putting together blocks to create this quilt, and then it was going to be finished by someone, and then probably auctioned off. Unfortunately, it was never finished, so now we have it here in the collection in its unfinished state. Um, but it still provides a lot of really interesting um, information and a, kind of a glimpse into this really unique art form. So we'll take a closer look at some of the elements on this particular quilt as well as a few others. Crazy quilts are made up of many many different elements. You got the embroidery stitches, you have the fabric itself, sometimes there's ribbons and other embellishments that kind of pop off the quilt, there's artwork, there's initials, sometimes there's even pieced blocks within these larger blocks. We'll take a closer look at some of these particular elements in the next few slides. First one is fabric choices. Now the story goes that women would go dig through people's closets, cut out pieces of fabric that they liked, particularly silk linings and men's jackets and hats, and they'd incorporate them into the, their quilts. But these fabrics could come from anywhere. We have one quilt in the collection where all the fabrics come from a woman's brother's trip around, the, around Europe. Um, so but many of these other ones might just be pieces of fabric that people took from old dresses, took from linings, um, and found in other various places. Um, they could also trade scraps with other people as well. But having so many different types of fabric in a quilt can make it really challenging to preserve this quilt. You can see another video where we talk a little bit more about that. But it really creates this really interesting variation of textures, and it really makes you wonder where the fabrics came from. If someone at some point in time could have sat down with this block and said, that piece of kind of orange color near the bottom is from my grandmother's dress, or this other one is from a dress that I wore at this very important occasion in my life. Um, so looking at all these different fabrics, unfortunately we don't have documentation on this, but it kind of makes you wonder where these pieces of someone's life came from. Another element is embroidery. On this particular piece, of course, you can see all the various stitches keeping the pieces of fabric together, but you can also see some really fancy embroidery, including this uh, Asian-style fan and the circle down kind of near the corner. And when it comes to crazy quilts, one of the things they're largely known for is their elaborate embroidery. And some of it, of course, is decorative, while other Others have different uh, attributions to them, like there's a story about how every crazy quilt contains a spider as a sign of good luck. But many of these embroidery motifs that show up um, are, sometimes they're just random items, other times you'll notice that they're things that are found in the home where a woman's realm was at the time. But particularly with this uh, Asian style fan that shows up, that's another way that these um, kind of Asian art forms made an appearance in uh, the Victorian period in these crazy quilts, as it was a pretty popular uh, kind of design form at the time. Um, but some of the other ones are just maybe doodles that people wanted to do or designs that they might have found in various magazines or things that they just made up. The art of painting was also something that was in the ladies' realm at the time, and you'll notice on some of these quilts that there are hand-painted things like mostly flowers on these quilts, um, including one here in the bottom left corner of a rosebud it looks like. Um, over time, these paintings pieces have kind of flaked off on many of these quilts, but the ones that are still very well preserved are really incredible to look at. And it shows a lot of the skill that these women had in various forms of textile work. As I said, women would go around and they'd find different pieces of cloth and fabric to incorporate into their art pieces, um, including things like ribbons. Um, there's a ribbon here kind of in the center of the picture that I zoom in off to the right here, and it says Eureka number 229 IOGT. That's International Order of the Good Templars. It was a temperance organization. But these ribbons and things were very popular to give out for different fraternal groups and events and things like that. Um, and it can provide 
really interesting information on possibly who made the quilt or when it was made. If you could look up when this organization was around, you could possibly get a better idea of when this quilt was made. And you'll see these ribbons show up in various different places, and it really adds some really exciting value to the quilts themselves. This is probably one of my favorite quilts in the collection. Um, it was made as a wedding gift, and part of the reason why I really love this quilt is the embroidery work. So let's take a closer look. So whoever embroidered on this quilt was obviously very skilled. You can see how equally spaced the stitches are, how even they are, um, and it's just a really incredible piece of work here. Taking a bit of a more zoomed out look at this quilt, you can see that really great consistency in the stitches all throughout it, but also in just the great variation of stitches. And many of these stitches do have names, other ones are kind of compilation stitches, ones that were improvised or made up or found in books and things like that. So it can be really hard to name all of them as you're going through and looking at them. That was part of the project I was trying to do was trying to get names to all these stitches, but it was really hard just because of all of the massive um, variation that you can see. But in this particular piece here, you could see various silks, you can see velvets, you can see painted flowers, and we'll take a closer look at some of these other embellishments. Here are some great little flowers here, these purple ones. They always make me think of um, Alice in Wonderland whenever I see this particular quilt. Um, but it again showcases the skill that these women had to be able to paint, to be able to embroider, and to be able to find these really exciting fabrics. Here's another little painting of an owl, or two owls on a tree branch, um, incorporated with this really just outstanding stitch work. This is a great little painting on this quilt. It says, good luck, and it's got a horseshoe, which of course is a symbol of good luck. Um, and this was of course incorporated into this wedding quilt as a good luck charm for the newlyweds. So something else to consider about crazy quilts is that these were high-end fabrics, and the reason why they were pieced back together again is because they might have been damaged in one way or another, but the maker still wanted to be able to use the pieces. And these quilts are also very much a status symbol of a woman who could have all these different types of fabrics or be able to have access to these varieties of fabrics through people she knew or things she had purchased herself or her husband had purchased. And it was a way to really show off that social status, economic status, um, and skill. So this is the last quilt I'll be talking about today, but this particular one is really exciting when it comes to motifs and those little art pieces that I mentioned a little earlier. Of course, each of these quilts have their own personality. You can look at the stitch work here and notice that it's not quite as fine as the previous quilt, but the maker really took their time on putting in these really cute motifs like this little bird here and this little flower. And in this one we have an owl, we have a fish, we also have a rocking chair. So this one's got all kinds of natural elements, like the fish and the owl, but it also has household elements like the chair. Here we have a couple, a couple of bugs, a bird, and a broom. And of course, this is also at a time when there was an expansion in the idea of the women's realm to also start including places like the garden and um, even in some areas, preservation work like the Redwood Conservation Movement. So this was a really interesting time when it comes to the expectations of women and how they were starting to really change. So this is kind of a similar picture to what we were just looking at, but one thing I want to highlight here are the two fans that kind of appear in the upper right corner here. So I mentioned that various embellishments like embroidery pieces um, or these motifs would include Asian elements like fans, but they were also included in the piecework as well, as you can see here, and that shows up on many of the crazy quilts that we will see throughout the Clark collections. Here's another cute uh, butterfly or moth, it looks like. Um, one other thing to notice in this one, and it's pretty small, so you'll see my mouse move across the screen here, but this quilt, along with being uh, embroidered together, was also tied 
So that there's a tie there, there's a tie there. So what that did was the embroidery work might embellish the seams on the blocks that were made, but to keep the front of the quilt together with the actual back of the quilt, if there was any batting, which is the filling part, of course, of the quilt, um, people would add these ties to keep the quilt in its sandwiched form, as quilting people call it. Um, and that also added some stability to the quilt as well, and reduced some of the strain that might be on the stitches from someone pulling the quilt. Another thing to note is that these quilts were kind of more decorative than useful. Um, I'm sure people did use them, but people would put them on piano benches, on their couches maybe, as decorative pieces. There was one story I read about a young man who had a scarf that was made out of various scraps of fabric that different women had given him over time as kind of a status symbol of how many women were interested in him, uh, which I found to be pretty amusing. This quilt also features two embroidered names or initials. So of course Ella is here on the left, E-A-B is on the right. We don't know exactly who Ella was, if she was the one that the quilt was for, or if she was the one who made the quilt. Um, but there's some really fine embroidery work when it comes to making these letters and incorporating them into the piece. Here we can see a couple of interesting pieces of fabric used, including this one where this tan piece was um, damaged in some way and a circular piece was pieced into it. A very similar thing happens up here where there's some embroidery work along the edges and then some white here. Um, but also here's another one of those really interesting ribbons that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's also these circles that are embroidered along with a cute dog. I always appreciate it when they include dogs in their quilts. Here's a closer look at that ribbon. It says Farmer's Festival, Galpin Mill, September 4th, 89. And that was uh, 1889 rather than 1989. So this gives us kind of an idea of when this quilt might have been made. Um, late 1800s. Although, of course, that ribbon could have been old by the time it was incorporated into the quilt. It could have been new. You really never know. Here's another one of those Asian style fans that we've seen on a couple of the other quilts. So something to note at this point in time is that particularly in the West, there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment. Um, there were Chinese immigrants coming here to work on the railroads and other various projects, but there was a lot of just anti-Asian sentiment. And that was being promoted and cultivated by all kinds of different groups, including unions, the state, local, and federal governments, and many other powerful individuals. So while people at this time were interested in the artwork of these people, they weren't necessarily interested in the people themselves, which is kind of a painful part of this history, but one that's really worth noting. Here's a couple more pieces where there's some household scissors and a boot along with some really great stitch work here that kind of looks like blooming flowers, um, fences, and you can see there's different velvets and silks incorporated into this. Um, just a really, really nice quilt. And our final slide today is this really great one. Um, when I first took a look at this quilt, I noticed this painted flower here, but I didn't notice what was hidden underneath it um, until we had gone back to go through these pictures and this guy peeked through. So what this probably was, was there are things called cigarette silks. And what they were, were they were little pieces of silk that became popular at this particular period in time because of crazy quilts. And so what would happen is your husband or who not would purchase a package of cigarettes and these silks would come in it. And there would be a different silk in every pack. Um, so you had to try to collect them all. And it was a way to get women to encourage their husbands or whoever else to purchase specific brands if they wanted to get the full set. One of the sets we have here at the museum includes flags of different countries. We have ones where they're uh, logos of different universities. Sometimes they would just have attractive looking women or men on them, which is probably what this one was. But I'm wondering why the maker of this quilt decided to paint over that. I mean, I guess if 
you don't really want the guy's face on there, but you like the color, might as well paint over it. Um, but that was an interesting trend that came about with kind of coexisting with the rise of the crazy quilt trend as these women were looking for different pieces of silk to incorporate into their pieces. Another form of this is called a cigar silk, and these were long ribbons that were sometimes yellow, but you can see them in purples and greens as well, um, that had the names of cigar companies on them, and they were used to tie cigars into bundles. Um, and quilts made out of strictly cigar silks are very rare to find. We do have one here at the museum, um, but they're just incredible pieces. They look very uniform, but the fact that they're all these teeny strips of silk sewn together is what makes them truly incredible. So I just want to say thank you everyone for tuning in. If you have any questions, feel free to contact the Clark Museum. You can give us a call at 707-443-1947 or swing by the museum on a day we're open. Thanks again and I hope you have a good day.